Hello, my name is Henrik Johnson. I'm an independent entrepreneur commenting on politics in general, and Swedish politics in particular. Last week, state-run media interviewed Mr. Joachim Roist, a doctor on immigration and economics, on his recently released paper on the financial impact of immigration to Sweden. I'm using the interview and how it proceeded as a basis for a commentary on facts versus feelings in contemporary Swedish discourse. Stay tuned! From 1944, a Japanese soldier by the name of Hiro Onoda hunkered down in the jungles of the Philippines for nearly three decades, refusing to believe that World War II had ended. Without any disrespect to my countrymen, this is an excellent allegory of current Swedish discourse or morality. Now, let me begin by establishing myself as a libertarian. I have no issue whatsoever with self-sufficient migration, in fact, the subject rather bores me. I do, however, care deeply about business, growth and innovation, and firmly side with forces supporting these causes. My lifelong experience as an entrepreneur has taught me one indisputable absolute. The bottom line is a harsh mistress that will not be cheated by any number of fancy words. Sweden a starkly homogenous and fiercely egalitarian culture, which recently self-branded as a humanitarian superpower, has for a number of years vigorously defended a very generous migration policy. Part of this is rooted in sensible market economics. Borders and protectionism harm growth and stifle innovation. Another part of it is rooted in idealism that ignores the financial structures underpinning Sweden's exceptionally opulent and popular welfare state. The Nobel Prize-winning economist Milton Friedman summarized this eloquently in the 1970s. It is one thing to have free immigration to jobs. It is another thing to have free immigration to welfare. And you cannot have both. To a large extent, the Swedish establishment has tried to ignore this dichotomy, pretending it possible to both have the cake and eat it. The desire to reconcile this impossible equation has produced an increasingly irresponsible establishment discourse denying the need for welfare reform, while still embracing large-scale immigration under the premise of a long-term profitability. All along, without a budget factoring in the overhead investment. Let it be noted that Sweden is a highly organized society, and there is normally a very detailed budget for even the smallest of projects. Sweden's financial high-tax system is characterized by transparency and accountability, with one exception, migration. For years, any suggestion that the government should obtain some data on the financial impact of immigration has been aggressively shot down on moral grounds. Here are a few short clips from when the Council of Stockholm rejected a proposition to analyze immigration financially. You are a man who is 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 a The emotional and aggressive reactions are particularly striking, since this is not a debate about rejecting migration. This is a debate rejecting knowledge about migration. There is reason to be concerned when the political establishment sees knowledge as an enemy. This tendency has been dominating the public discourse for a number of years, and there has been a strong desire among the establishment to communicate immigrants as profitable. With my mind, oh my money, yeah, my money, oh my On the 31st of May 2014, one of Sweden's largest left-leaning newspapers published a euphoric article on a report on a massive income profitability in the community of Sandviken. Sandviken had ordered the report themselves and were very vocal about their success story. Both the report and the newspaper article failed to mention that the profit accrued due to the council equalization system, which for a short time would inject taxpayers' money into communities based on the number of immigrants they absorbed. Three years later, 
as the equalization of tax money expired. Sandviken is facing massive deficits and the community is reported to be facing financial disaster. One might infer that uh, the individuals who did not understand the contents of the Sandviken report and its figures are likely unfit for public office. And if they did indeed understand it, and were using taxpayers' money to finance a report to engage in pro-migration advocacy, they ought to face trial. And the journalists who uncritically published it as a success story are either guilty of attempting to delude the public or of severe incompetence. Similarly, Swedish state media and several other publications reported largely unsubstantiated claims that the individuals migrating to Sweden were well-educated engineers, doctors, economists, adding huge value and competence to the Swedish economy. As it has since become evident that there were fewer engineers and more individuals struggling with basic reading and writing skills, this is no longer mentioned. A state-run media interviewed Dr. Joachim Royst on his research paper on immigration and economics. We got to see the final act of this battle play out for open curtains. Ja, då säger jag välkommen till Joakim Röst som är nationalekonom och migrationsforskare och som står bakom den här rapporten. Dr. Royce's calculations indicate a negative net result per immigrant of 74,000 Swedish crowns, which is about 8,500 US dollars. Men varför är det viktigt att göra det här och att utreda och slå fast vad en flykting kostar? This is valuable information as a democracy should choose to finance immigration not for its profitability but for humanitarian reasons. But in order to finance it and establish a democratic mandate to do so, the cost needs to be known so that a well-founded debate and investigation of governmental financial priorities can be carried out. Men rapporten har fått en hel del kritik idag, ska vi också säga. Bland annat från ekonomen Sandro Skocko som menar att den, det den egentligen visar är att folk med låg lön är mindre lönsamma för staten än de med hög lön. There is at the present moment no basis for saying that Dr. Roy's report has been getting a lot of criticism. The one individual criticizing it is Mr. Sandro Skocko, who is not a scientist, but a chief economist at the left-leaning and union-financed think tank Arena. De som helt enkelt har den sämsta situationen på arbetsmarknaden, det är utifrån ett statsfinansiellt perspektiv så kommer det ske en omfördelning från övriga kollektivet till den här gruppen. Och det gäller i lika hög grad svenskfödda som är i samma situation. What he is essentially saying is that low productive people are loss making in general regardless of origin. Nobody is contesting this. But this does in no way negate the relevance for knowing the societal cost for various demographics. Saying it's not the cost that is high, it is the income that is too low, is like saying, oh, he's not poor, he just doesn't have any money. In the end, from a budget perspective, this is an immaterial play of words. Andra som menar också att, um, att det finns en samhällsekonomisk vinst med flyktingar. Att det finns en samhällsekonomisk vinst med, med invandringen. Ja. Jag tror att det är svårt att säga att det finns en samhällsekonomisk vinst med flyktinginvandringen. Worlds are colliding. The narrative of profitability reaching back to the disastrous Sandviken report and the impopular facts the Council of Stockholm so vehemently opposed in 2017 is now destroying the last remnants of the Onoda jungle fortress. Det här är ju en het fråga nu i valrörelsen. Tror att den kommer användas i valrörelsen den här rapporten? Det tror jag kanske inte så mycket. Jag vet inte vad, vad mer jag ska säga om det. Jag bara undrar om det, om det är sånt som du tar, har liksom tänkt och tagit hänsyn till när du gör en sån här rapport som förmodligen kommer bli kontroversiell. This question exposes the malady of the current journalistic establishment. A scientist is interrogated by a journalist on whether he is considered how his findings might be used politically. The question is indirectly insinuating that he should have, and by not doing it, he might have a suspect and subversive agenda. To put this into perspective, let's consider the likelihood of Dr. Royce getting a similar question if his research had indicated that CO2 emissions by air traffic were far worse than anyone suspected. The journalist going, this is controversial. Have you considered how your report on CO2 emissions might be used by the Greens? Does he have a secret agenda? As facts are beginning to penetrate the debate, 
the forces defending the now defunct, fact-resistant, ideological narrative are growing increasingly desperate. On the 27th of May, one of Sweden's largest newspapers, again it's the same one I keep referring to, produced an editorial celebrating the record numbers we're not allowed to talk about. The report was produced by the Statistical Central Bureau and indicated an occupancy increase of 4.2% since last year. It's important to note that Swedish institutions use two different metrics to determine unemployment. One is employment statistic and the other is occupancy statistics. Occupancy, which the SCB report measures, do not only take into account those who are doing actual productive work, but also those engaged in government programs for the unemployed, and those who have worked one single hour per week or more. It is absurd to consider the editor-in-chief for the newspaper unfamiliar with how a normal boom and bust cycle functions. A growth rate of occupancy, not employment, in the middle of a 10-year-long boom cycle, while the Swedish krona is losing ground and exports are at a standstill, cannot under any circumstances be construed as record numbers. The reason that nobody is talking about any record numbers is because they do not exist. I simply am not there. As part of the same campaign, the same newspaper also recently published two debate pieces, one signed by a list of eight researchers on ethics, the second one by six civil society organizations. The first one accused politicians of losing their moral compass, the second one claimed hate is gaining ground. They're both responses to the emergence of undesirable scientific data and a fiscal policy rooted in a less frivolous notion of how an economy functions. And ultimately, they're a reaction to their own loss of control over the public discourse. Just a year ago or two, these activists and institutions wielded the power to dethrone politicians, to cast out celebrities and to ruin the careers of those daring to voice undesired opinions. In fact, a video like this would most likely have been reported as a hate crime in 2015. The desire to do this stemmed from the best of intentions, but had the worst of consequences. Large swaths of the establishment considered the public incapable of digesting complex material and worried they would become fascist xenophobes by misunderstanding unfiltered information. Hence, the general public discourse was uh, polished. Wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. And adjusted to communicate a coherent and easy to understand narrative emphasizing the desired worldview. As a result, the general public, not being quite as thick as expected, gradually lost their trust in traditional media and migrated to alternative media online. The traditional media houses were quick to label these alternative news sources as illegitimate purveyors of fake news and moved for political legislation against their existence. I've made several videos about this before, I'll put the link somewhere up here for those interested in the details. And now the tides are turning. With the traditional parliamentarian structures collapsing and the demands for facts and accountability soaring. The radical establishment is being pushed back by a more conservative popular demand. But much like Hiro or Noda, they do not yet understand that they are fighting a battle in a war that has already been lost. The consequences of this ideological war has been stark and severe, much like the story of Anakin Skywalker's deep-rooted fear of loss and love. I am becoming more powerful than any Jedi has ever dreamed of. And I'm doing it for you. The path of control these institutions chose eventually turned themselves and society into the very thing that we're trying to prevent. <gasps> you turned her against me! As the cost of migration policies begin to permeate the welfare system and the conflicting objectives between identity politics and a severely taxed workforce are clashing. We ought to prepare for a very rude awakening for people who've made facts their enemy. Do you agree that facts are better suited for establishing policy than feelings? Share this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and please have your say in the comment section. I appreciate all respectful commentary. If you appreciate my videos, feel free to support me using Patreon. There is a link for this purpose down below. I am Henrik Johnson. Thank you for watching this video.